we've finished uh, our third moral theory, utilitarianism or consequentialism, and there's uh, two points that I want to cover at the end to sort of sum things up. So the first point is about utilitarianism and how radical moral theory can be, how radical moral theory ought to be. So if you think about the three theories we've looked at, Aristotle, Kant, and Mill, Aristotle is very explicitly not trying to give us surprising answers or strange answers or weird answers or unintuitive answers. Aristotle is trying to capture the sort of basic uh, notions of morality that are floating around at the time that he's writing, and he's trying to sum them all up and come to the most philosophical conclusion about them and the most refined, well thought through conclusion about them. He's not he's sort of assuming from the outset that we're not going to get any completely strange or completely weird results. The logic is not going to force us into anything crazy or unusual. Similarly, a little less so, but along the same lines, Kant isn't setting out to give us a strange or weird moral theory or one with strange or weird conclusions. If you think back to the preface and the first part of the groundwork, he says we're sort of starting from common moral cognition and building a moral theory that uh, reflects this, which is a sort of more philosophically refined version of this. And certainly the results that Aristotle and Kant get are um, in a lot of ways pretty conservative is maybe too strong a word, but not radical or revolutionary. Uh, Kant is a little strict about morality, but the sort of moral rule that he comes up with and the deductions that he gets from that look pretty much like a lot of the moral rules that we see in a lot of the societies around, and certainly that we saw in the society Kant was living in. Similarly, Aristotle, uh, because of the way he's doing things, he's not coming up with something very strange from our perspective or something very strange from his perspective. Mill says he's doing something similar to Aristotle and something similar to Kant. Mill goes to great lengths in this book we just read to show that utilitarianism is sort of based on something we're already doing. We already care about pleasure and pain, Mill thinks, so utilitarianism is just making this the standard of good. And every time you think you care about something else, like justice, Mill is trying to say, no, here's why you actually care about it. It's because justice has to do with pleasure and pain and stuff, and really utilitarianism can tell a good story. And so the impression you might get when you initially read this book is that Mill, like Aristotle and Kant, is not trying to give us like a crazy moral theory or a radical moral theory or something that changes our views about lots of things. And however true that is or isn't for John Stuart Mill as a person, it's pretty false for utilitarianism and consequentialism generally, because if you think about the structure of utilitarian theory, utilitarianism says what is good is pleasure and avoidance of pain, and what we want is to get the most good. We want to do what will give us the most good. That, in principle, allows for anything anything including crazy stuff as long as it gets you the most good. So utilitarianism potentially says, look, if eventually we can uh, breed a creature that experiences super duper amounts of pleasure uh, just by feeding it apples, and this creature gets more pleasure from eating apples than any human being will ever get from anything, then we should breed as many of these creatures as possible and feed them all the apples and devote our lives basically to putting apples into these creatures. <laughs> that is very weird. Utilitarianism says, look, if it would uh, lead to more pleasure and less pain to do all sorts of unjust things, we should do all sorts of unjust things or uh, traditionally evil things or unvirtuous things. If it, lying or cheating or something would lead to more pleasure, we should do that. Again, Mill thinks, look, let's be reasonable about this. Lying and cheating and doing unjust things typically doesn't lead to more pleasure, so it's not like utilitarianism is telling us to actively be bad. But he's only saying this because the structure of utilitarianism allows for any old thing, including any old bad thing, bad thing, in quotes, as long as it gets you more pleasure and less pain. 
So utilitarianism, at least in its structure, which is just there's one good thing, and that's pleasure and absence of pain, and we should get the most of that as we can. In its structure, it allows for, in principle, any sort of radical stuff, redesigning the entire society, genetic modification, building robots that span the universe, like whatever, whatever crazy things you can think up, but think up as long as they promote more pleasure and minimize pain than doing anything else, this is what the utilitarian says to do. So again, Mill as a person seemed to think that utilitarianism won't lead to crazy conclusions because rather sensible things will promote the most pleasure and reduce the most pain. And I think probably, well, some people think probably he's right about that in a lot of cases. So in a lot of cases, you won't want to do crazy things. In a lot of cases, you will want to be a traditionally good person, and that will promote pleasure and not pain. But there's nothing in the structure of utilitarian theory that guarantees it. Utilitarianism is sort of hostage to empirical facts about what will cause the most pleasure and prevent the most pain. And so if those facts turn out to be very strange ones, utilitarianism will tell us to do very strange things. Is this a problem for utilitarianism? People are divided. So Aristotle would think this is a huge problem. His entire methodology is, look, let's start what seems reasonable about ethics and get the most refined version of that. If utilitarianism turns out to be very unreasonable, it's just not even like a live option in the first place. It doesn't even get included in our thinking because it's just, that, that can't be right. That's too crazy. Kant, it's less clear whether he'd have a problem with it. He thinks one nice thing about his system is that it's relatively simple and it's basically the same thing you're already doing in morality. It's just a more refined version of it. But I don't know. Kant as a person seems to be maybe okay with the idea that morality would tell us surprising things, things we don't initially agree with. Uh, because look, if it's the most rational thing to do, then it's what you ought to do, even if you sort of, it initially strikes you as wrong. So I don't know how Kant would feel. Mill, again, it's kind of hard to tell, uh, but just forgetting the three people we've read and talking about people generally, some people think it's a real problem for moral theory if it tells us completely strange, bizarre answers. It says what we should do, morally speaking, is genetically engineer a creature to love apples and then convert half of the earth into apple trees and the other half into houses for these creatures. That's just, that's ridiculous. You can't have a moral theory like that. So lots of philosophers are on that side. Moral theory just can't be too weird or it can't be too radical. You've gone wrong somewhere if you get a conclusion like that. And then there's philosophers on the other side who say, Look, weirdness is not like one of the criteria for moral theories. Morality might be very weird. There might be very strange conclusions about what's good and bad. If we have good arguments defending the weird stuff, then we should go with the weird stuff. If Mill gives us good arguments for thinking the only good thing is pleasure and absence of pain, if he's right about that, then we go where the empirical facts take us. Are they going to take us to weird places? Hopefully not for our sake, like weirdness strikes us as weird. We want to sort of keep living the lives that we want to live. But that's not up to us. It's up to morality and the empirical fact of the matter. So we'll see what happens. So uh, I'm not going to decide the question for you, but that's sort of two ways of thinking about ethics, one of which is relatively hostile to utilitarianism. If you don't like the weird stuff, then I should be using this hand because this is where I position them in space. The relatively hostile to utilitarianism, there's still space for utilitarianism if you don't like the weird stuff. Mill might be one of these people who doesn't like the weird stuff, and he says, look, utilitarianism basically gets us effectively normal morality just with a few changes. So maybe Mill is over here. But in general, if you're over here and you think weird stuff is bad, you're often not going to be happy with utilitarianism, especially because it at least admits the possibility of weird stuff. Utilitarianism can't rule out the weird stuff automatically. It just rules out the weird stuff, if it can, by saying, oh, it's just an empirical fact of the matter that it's not going to promote utility to do weird stuff. So if you're over here and you say no weird stuff in ethics, chances are you're not going to be a fan of utilitarianism. If you're over here and you're like, look, I'll just go where the arguments take me and where the empirical facts take me, then you won't have a problem with utilitarianism. And in fact, you might think this is a benefit of utilitarianism because you think, look, 
it's not limited by just our sort of subjective feelings of what ethics should be, it's weird or something. Utilitarianism is a strictly logical approach to ethics, which just says there's a good thing and we want to maximize the good thing, and so it's very straightforward and we go where the argument takes us. So this might be a benefit. It gets around human biases and cultural biases, and it just gets us straight to what actually matters. So maybe it's good. So that was the first topic, radicalism or weirdness in moral theory. The second topic is non-humans. Mill doesn't spend a long time talking about it. Maybe we can find it in the text. Um, he says, here's the standard of morality uh, on page eight. The standard of morality is the rules and precepts for human conduct such that the observance of them would provide the best possible guarantee of existence, such as has been described, for all mankind and, so far as the nature of things allows, for the whole sentient creation. So again, he doesn't make a big deal of this, but for Mill and for the other utilitarians, it's not just humans. Humans are the only ones to whom the moral rules apply. So moral rules in terms of what you should do and what I should do, those only apply to us because we're the only ones who can think about what we're doing and make choices based on what we're doing. But what's good, what, we, what the moral rules say, what we should be trying to promote or what we should tr be trying to do with morality is to promote not just the best existence for all mankind, but for the whole sentient creation. Everything that experiences pleasure and pain counts in utilitarianism, and it counts equally, in fact. Your pleasure and pain does not matter any more or any less than the pleasure and pain of a bull or a cat or any sentient creature. The whole is sentient creation, as Mill says. Now, Mill does have the distinction between higher and lower pleasures, and he says the higher pleasures are better. So if it's you versus the cat, since you can experience higher pleasures, often that's gonna put you above the cat. So if I have a choice between feeding uh, or petting a cat or um, reading a poem, the cat's gonna get some pleasure if I pet the cat. I'm gonna get higher pleasure if I read the poem. The cat gets lower pleasure, I get higher pleasure. Higher pleasure is better than lower pleasure, so it'll make more sense for me to give myself the pleasure than the cat. So Mill kind of has a bifurcation which is sometimes going to privilege humans. Certainly it's not going to allow us to harm animals for the sake of lower pleasures, so it looks like this is gonna rule out killing and eating animals uh, for the sake of just like gustatory pleasure because it tastes good that's going to be a lower pleasure so already that's going to sort of change what a lot of people do a lot of people will eat animals and that looks like it's going to be off the table if you're not mill if you don't have the higher lower pleasure distinction if you're a different kind of utilitarian like bentham bentham only has the lower pleasures or not no he's got all the pleasures but they're all like in one bundle for him so he doesn't divide them into higher and lower they just all the pleasures are good for the same reason so bentham says look pet the cat versus read a poem i don't know just measure the amount of pleasure and if the cat gets more you should pet the cat so the basic point is that look anything that can feel pleasure or pain counts for utilitarianism and that's very very different from what we see in aristotle and mill and broadly in a lot of other ethical theories. Utilitarianism and consequentialism are ethical theories that do much better in terms of elaborating duties to uh, non-humans. They just, it's very easy to fit in non-humans to utilitarianism. It's very hard to fit it into Kant or Aristotle or deontology or virtue ethics. So is that a benefit or um, a drawback? It depends how you feel about non-humans how you feel about all of sentient creation. Mill and Bentham saw this as really good. Like it's really good that utilitarianism eliminates the human bias from morality. It allows us to realize that goodness is not limited to us, it's limited to everybody. And uh, you know, it matters how you treat a dog just as it matters how you treat a fellow human being. So that's one potential benefit for utilitarianism. But uh, Kant, and potentially Aristotle would say, well, no, that's just, I don't, these things don't matter. I don't, what are you talking about? Non-humans morally matter. So um, again, a decision for you to make in terms of whether you find utilitarianism compelling or not.